Earlier today, we showcased some of the new technologies you've seen in the video developed right here in Ontario, aimed at fulfilling our mission of improving brain health. I'd like to give a special thanks to our partners for this showcase, the City of Mississauga and Johnson & Johnson Innovation. Also thanks to our key sponsor, Eli Lilly Canada, Shire and Age Well. We're thrilled to be able to host our first public event here in Mississauga, and it's actually one of the, uh, it's this, actually the second largest life science cluster in Canada, and I didn't actually know that. It's very impressive. We also recognize Mississauga's role in Neurotech Ontario. It's the name we use for the ecosystem of companies that we're supporting to create new products that can help improve patient care and quality of life. The entrepreneurs, and you uh, heard about the uh, fact that we start this with the letters O-N in misspelling, specifically to refer to Ontarians. Uh, and one way we promote this entrepreneurship culture is by supporting these entrepreneurs with a $50,000 training award, along with mentorship to ensure the success in building a neurotech company. To date, these Ontario Entrepreneurs Program has supported 34 neurotech entrepreneurs who have gone on to secure over $17.2 million in additional investments. And I hope you're able to meet many of these entrepreneurs in the lobby before uh, the session. Part of the activities that we had on earlier today was our first ever Ontario Entrepreneurs Pitch Challenge, where last year's entrepreneurs who just completed their program with OBI presented their pitch about their technology and their company. And you may have seen the video that was playing earlier. I'm excited that we will now announce the winners of the Pitch Challenge, the grand prize valued at over $2,000, including a cash prize and a one-year membership in the Neurotechnology Industry Association based in San Francisco. They're supposed to, there we go. Okay, so the, the runner-up of this program is Jonathan Lung. And so per perhaps you guys could, could join me on the, on the uh, stage here. And the winner is Vera Nedadovic, uh, who you saw in the video a moment ago. So join me in uh, congratulating these two. Vera's on her way. So there'll surely be photographs, so uh, front and center. Congratulations. Thank you. There you go, Vera. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's just a pleasure. All right. So congratulations to these, of these two Ontario entrepreneurs. So now moving on to the talk, which I'm very eager to hear and hope you are as well. Tonight we're about to learn of some of the incredibly fascinating things that our brains do for us. In all its sophistication, the brain is just as likely as any uh, organ in, in the body. And so we're able to hear to learn what happens when things might go wrong. In Ontario alone, there are more than 135,000 patients living with dementias like Alzheimer's. Because of the great need for better understanding of how to manage treat and prevent these disorders, the OBI has placed a major research focus through our Ontario Neurodegeneration Research Program called ONDRI. This program is pretty unique in its approach in that it is kind of disease label agnostic. It refers to patients who have dementia across different disorders, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, and others. It's our hope that the work carried out by this study will help us diagnose these disorders earlier, improve the care that patients receive, or people receive, and even in the community, and eventually discover treatments that will slow these diseases from progressing and even prevent them altogether. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. Susan Ormiston probably needs no introduction, but she's a senior correspondent within CBC News, and she has had a, an award-winning career in journalism that spans more than 25 years. She's reported from 25 countries in conflict zones, including Afghanistan, Egypt, Libya, the Ukraine, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. She's also reported on a wide range of Canadian and world events, including Nelson Mandela's election as president of South Africa in 1994, and his death nearly 20 years later. She's won three Geminis, including Best Reportage for her work in Afghanistan, the Best Digital for a Canadian Election Special, called the Ormiston Online, in 2011, she won a Foreign Press Association Award in London. She's a frequent guest host for CBC News Network and CBC programs including The National, The Current, and As It Happens. She's also reported for the Fifth Estate and Marketplace. Tonight, she's graciously volunteered her time to introduce us to the subject of tonight's talk and to share her personal experience with us. Her introduction will be followed by a presentation of, by Dr. Guy Seabrook, 
Guy is the Vice President of Neuroscience Inno and Scientific Innovation at Johnson & Johnson Innovation, based in California. Part of his role is to cultivate a strong scientific network of experts in the global innovation community, which includes their new J-Labs Toronto community, and the Neuroscience Catalyst program based out of the University of Toronto. Guy has more than 25 years of drug discovery research, experience in the pharmaceutical industry, with a particular focus on Alzheimer's. He graduated with a PhD in zoology from the Euro University of Nottingham, UK, and completed his postdoc research at the University of Miami School of Medicine in the USA. After Guy's presentation, Susan will interview him before opening up to the audience for questions and further discussion. So without further ado, please uh, help me welcome Susan Ormiston. I am here to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease and, um, you know, take us on a little personal journey. I'm going to share a story with you tonight about hats, humor, and heartache. It is the most painful story I've ever had to tell, and I've told thousands of stories, because as you probably know, if you've known someone with dementia, it really sears our soul with a long goodbye. But I'm here to tell you tonight that it can be funny, too, humorous at times, and yes, hopeful. First, the hats. Well, my grandmother lived in New York City. She was widowed young and lived in a large house with her two daughters. And in her late 60s, she began to act unusually. She would be very paranoid and suspicious of even those she loved the most and trusted. She used to go out for walks in the neighborhood. And when she went out just before, she'd go to the closet and she'd pick out her two hats. She'd put one on and then put another on top. And my aunt, who was living with her at the time, would say, Mother, why are you wearing two hats? And she turned to her one day and said, Well, that's simple, dear. The one on top is so that the one underneath won't blow away. <laughs> now, I was a young girl, but looking back, I realized that this was my first exposure to what I call Alzheimer logic. You may have experienced it yourself. There's no point really arguing with someone suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And sometimes, if you're patient, if you're open and not completely frustrated in the moment, you can see that that circuitous logic sometimes makes sense. My grandmother sadly died of Alzheimer's at age 73. About 25 years later, the disease took my mother at the very same age. She didn't live long enough to meet my children, one of my deepest regrets. That's the heartache among many. She would have loved my sons. And it is sobering to think first my grandmother, then my mother, who could blame myself and my sisters, my three other sisters, from wondering if one of us will go the same route. I'm a journalist, and sometimes I do fall prey to the limitations of media, the news cycle running at its ferocious pace, getting faster and faster every year, and the attention span of our consumers, we're told, shrinking every year. The competition is fierce for stories. They get shorter and less meaningful in some respects. And I once asked a medical reporter what she thought about Alzheimer's disease and how it's portrayed on her beat. And she said, well, there is acute and growing awareness, thank goodness, in this country that Alzheimer's disease is important and the realization that many, many more will be affected as our population ages. But she cautioned, she said, we've been covering the ongoing developments in Alzheimer's disease and research for a long time. Now I guess we're really looking for the big one. I said, the big one? I'm pretty sure that for everyone who's been touched by Alzheimer's disease, it's a big deal. A soul-sucking, painful curse with no way out. No, 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 she said, I meant, the big one, the cure. Well, we know that hasn't come. And along the way, we've had to exercise, and not always successfully, deep caution, even skepticism about reporting claims of big advances in Alzheimer's disease. The research landscape is hard to navigate sometimes. Our guest tonight, Guy Seabrook is going to help us navigate some of that, tell us more about what's real and what are the expectations in research 
and what the projections say about prevalence and incidence, which are different, I learned. It's been a long time since I began speaking about Alzheimer's disease, not because my story is that much more unique to many of yours, but I am a professional storyteller. And in my role as observer, I've seen so much to cheer about. That's the hope part. Fifteen years ago, Alzheimer's disease and the stigma around it was thick, oppressive, and often isolating. People were so afraid of dementia, circling around it, backing away from it, denying it even, rather than reaching in and coming up with the necessary creative solutions to managing it and to caring for people with it. I remember the horror when my own sister said, we should write a letter to mom's friends about what's going on. We should tell her bridge club and the church circle and her social circle about what's going on and help them, educate them about how to handle it. I said, no, no, we don't want to do that. I, I couldn't see that, revealing all that. But she persevered and she was right because the letter went out and it said things like, Come, but if she offers you coffee, refuse because she can't do the coffee maker anymore. Please don't come at dinner time because she doesn't make meals anymore. But do come. Do come and walk around the garden with her and she'll be able to name a plant or two. The garden was her oasis. Please touch her, hug her. She'll feel that comfort and maybe team up with her as your partner in Bridge, two women as one player, just so she feels the community. In a certain stage, these are all things very important. I came around. I was a convert, a convert to that idea. It was a way of pulling away that stigma. Please consider how far we've come in this area. Consider last week in the House of Commons in Ottawa, a former cabinet minister, a woman, got up on World Alzheimer's Day and in tears thanked everyone for supporting Alzheimer's disease because her husband had recently been diagnosed with early onset. That wouldn't have happened even a decade ago. And everyone in the House of Commons is cheering and supporting and recognizing that dementia was not to be hidden away. That's hope. I often think about a woman I met about 10 or 15 years ago at an Alzheimer's Society convention in Halifax, one of my first. And it was the beginning of the evolution of our social education on Alzheimer's disease because it was no longer people like myself who'd cared for someone. It was people with Alzheimer's disease who were first starting to talk about it. And this woman was a scientist. She worked in Hamilton. And she was able at that stage in her disease to give a speech about what it was like, what it was like struggling to find solutions to the scientific problems presented to her, what it was like struggling to find words to talk about her research and what it was like hiding from her colleagues the fact she couldn't find those words, only to find out much later that in fact they recognized that something was wrong much earlier than she admitted it. Such bravery to lead us all into her world, to show us while she still could the power of breaking down stigma whilst fostering understanding. My mother knew long before we did that things were going wrong, that she was slipping, the signs were there, even if we didn't want to see them. Anxiety was one of the first big handicaps. She wouldn't let my father leave the house. There were hallucinations, ultimately, and early enough in her disease so that she knew she saw something and she knew we didn't. How frightening to be between those two worlds. But, you know, there were some funny changes. My mother was, had come from Virginian forebears. She was a proper woman, a, a very gracious person. And she grew up as a 1950s wife and moved to Saskatchewan. And she rarely said anything cruel or blunt. And, you know, Alzheimer's disease kind of freed her of that restriction. <laughs> she basically said whatever she believed and 
was kind of refreshing sometimes. I mean, gosh, it's so painful, you gotta laugh. Take my uncle, he was an irascible farmer, a bachelor, and he used to show up at our house mostly right at dinner time. And she put up with that for years until she got ill. And then one day she met him at the door and simply said, Stuart, we're not serving you dinner anymore. And that was the end of it. <laughs> when I got engaged later in life, my soon-to-be husband came to know my mother only as she was slipping into dementia, another big regret. But this stranger, my soon-to-be husband, who would soon be family, prompted a funny response from my mother. One day he showed up at our front door and she said, oh, Keith, you look so substantial. <laughs> and he kind of looked at her, he didn't know her that well. And we're, we laugh about it today because we're not sure if mom meant plump or prosperous or neither. That's the humor part. The last time I saw my mother, we were on a plane from Toronto to, um, I'm sorry, from Saskatoon to Victoria. I had flown in from Toronto to help my dad take her on a vacation to uh, Victoria. And you know, if you've lived with people with Alzheimer's, you know this scene. She would not buckle up her seatbelt. Nothing I could do would get her to sit in her seat and buckle up. It was taxing for all of us, the flight attendants included. Finally, settled off, they settled after takeoff, she turned to me and as if I were simply another passenger, a seatmate, she said, you know, I have four daughters. And I said, yes, appeasing her, at the same time struggling back a few tears with the recognition she didn't know me for that moment. And then she, quite matter of fact, said, and you know, the daughter in Ottawa, she's the only one with a good head on her shoulders. <laughs> Funny thing is, we all knew she kind of thought that, and she's probably right. And to this day, my sister in Ottawa teases me about that. Of course, normally, she would never have said it. So I'm here to tell you that Alzheimer's can be funny. It can be heartbreaking and it can be hopeful. And I'm now at the stage when I'm seeing more hope. I'm gonna wrap up now, but you're gonna learn a lot about your amazing brain tonight through our presentation. But do me one thing when you leave here. Help strip away the silence. Help rip down the veil that still remains the stigma. Really listen to people's stories with Alzheimer's disease because there is a whole lot of humanity and heart and Alzheimer logic lurking in there. You just might learn something. I'm going to invite uh, Guy Seabrook to come up and um, start his a uh, wonderful presentation on your amazing brain, and then we're going to have a little chat in a little bit. So it's quite staggering to think that there are over 7 billion people on this planet that sometime in their life are going to need health care. That's about 2 million people for every one of you in this room tonight. In 2025, that number is going to jump to 9 billion people, including 40 million Canadians. When I started in my career in drug discovery, uh, the last thing I had back in my mind was that one day uh, the drugs that I work on and, and try and create uh, will end up being used for uh, the people I love uh, and my loved ones. Um, this is a picture of my daughter Rose. Um, Rose uh, unfortunately suffers from migraines, um, as many in the audience might know that makes being out in bright light and cold weather sometimes excruciatingly painful. And so when I started my career back in early 1990s working on a drug to treat migraines, it really quite shocked me uh, when Rose was one of, the person, one, of the, one of the people who was a recipient for that medicine. It really does make a difference in her life uh, to have drugs like that available to her. And this is why drug discovery research has become so, so personal to, to me. In the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a, a journey um, 
and talk to you about how amazing your brain really is. I'm going to look at it through the lens of what Alzheimer's disease is to a patient and what's actually happening with inside the brain. Uh, I'll reflect on its portrayal in the media. Uh, and then lastly, finish off on some of the things we're trying to do to help tackle this devastating disease. But before I do so, I'm a scientist. I'd like to do experiments. I'm going to do an experiment on all of you guys. Before I do that, however, I just want to remind you of the fact that um, within the audience tonight, um, there are several different types of people. There are those people who have uh, exquisite memory for names and languages. Uh, there are other people in the room who have terrific memory for things like spatial navigation. And it's interesting, those combinations of people tend to happen in couples. Thank goodness for spatial navigation and, uh, and also these GPS systems you can now get in cars because my wife and I have just returned from a 3,000 mile trip up and down the West Coast. My son's just gone to college and we decided it would be a great thing to go off on one of these um, empty nested trips. And my wife thinks exactly like that. So if I ask her for directions, I get the name of the street. So I turn right on this street and left on that square. And I'm completely confused, to be honest with you. Um, I'd much rather sit down, look at the map, and try and orientate myself in space to where I'm going to end up going and uh, can invariably memorize things in, in that way. But there's a third group of you in this audience, um, probably the people who have not really decided which way their brain's going to go, and they tend to be the young people. But uh, they tend to be pretty good at both uh, aspects of learning and memory. The second thing I want to talk to you a little bit about before I go into the experiment is the fact that there are many games out there that can help you teach you um, about uh, mental acuity and objectivity. And I don't know how many of you have read um, uh, the book by, um, uh, called Kim uh, and Kim's Game. So this is the game where you get a tray, you throw a load of jewels down, cover it up with a muslin cloth, and the game is really to try and identify where those objects were in space and what objects were actually on the train in the first place. And this came from uh, Rudyard Kipling's book um, uh, about uh, the spy named Kim. Um, and he was training this kid to spy on the Russians. And it's actually quite an interesting game if you haven't played it. Actually, um, in uh, um, sniper school, they still teach Kim's game to snipers to teach them how to uh, recognize and uh, remember objects. But think about playing Kim's game with that fifth grader when you're 50 years old. It's actually incredible how good fifth graders are at those types of uh, games. And uh, I see many of you in the audience probably recognize uh, a child like that that you've uh, uh, worked with in the past. But no matter what type of memory you have, I'm going to show you in the next five minutes how easy it is to synchronize all of your minds very quickly. You're going to learn something very quickly something that is going to stay in your mind for days, weeks, if not years. And this is how quickly your brain can do it, no matter what type of memory you think you might have. So I'm going to show you a picture. And this picture is a black and white picture of an animal. If you think you know what the animal is, put your hand up. OK, so I see a few hands. Not everyone's putting their hands up. Sometimes people say they can see a picture of a running woman, or maybe it's a falcon with its wings outstretched coming down to land with its talons just reaching down to grab something off the ground. But that's not the case. If I show you the picture in the correct orientation, this is where your brain's going to do its magic and convert that very complex black and white image into something you can recognize instantly and it's something that's going to stay in your mind probably for the next few years. And here's the picture. So for some of you, you'll see in the top right-hand quadrant, there's a base of a tree. And in the middle of the picture, you'll see a Dalmatian with its head down to the ground, walking towards the tree, sniffing. And the two things that we thought were wings are actually the shadow of the dog in the image. Do most, of you, most people see that in the audience? Yeah. yeah. So literally in a space of a few minutes, your brains have developed this way of decoding that very complex image into something that you can now recognize. And if I showed you that same image now in a year's time or two years' time, you'll quickly go and judge uh, what that uh, creature is in the, in the image. Uh, and also to the point, and this is still a little bit more complex doing it, now if I revert the image back to the other direction where it's upside down, your brain can now, if you start to concentrate it, can sort of deconvolute it, even though it's a little bit more complex. 
you can now figure out where the base of the tree is, and you can start to see the, the head of the dog, the body of the dog, albeit upside down. That's how amazing your brain is. So no wires, no magic tricks, no drugs, perhaps a little bit of that caffeine from Tim Horton's coffee you might have had later on this afternoon, but that's how that's amazing your brain is. And your brain is doing this all the time, every minute of the day, whether you're conscious of it or not conscious of it. You have over 90 billion neurons in your brain, 10 times as many people that are going to be on this planet in 2025. Every one of those brain, uh, neurons in the brain can have up to 1,000, maybe 100,000 connections with its neighbors. Can you imagine having a conversation with 2 million people at the same time? That's what your brain is doing every millisecond, every second of the day. That's how amazing your brain really is. But your brain is also working very actively to try and um, interpret the world around you and is working pretty much in a dichotomous way. We like to think about things in black and white. We like to think about left and right, uh, right and wrong. And so your brain likes to sort of compartmentalize things because it makes decision making easy. That's also one of its fallacies. Your brain is also very good at deceiving you. If I was to tell you that the death rate associated with North Atlantic hurricanes was influenced by the time of the year, the day of the week, the wind speed, or even the location of landfall of the hurricane, you wouldn't be surprised. That's pretty, pretty obvious. Since the 19, 1979, the World Meteorological Organization has been naming hurricanes um, up over a six-year period against a strict list of alternating male-female names in an alphabetical order. So who would have thought that the death rate associated with North Atlantic hurricanes is actually associated with the name? Sounds pretty bizarre, doesn't it? If I was to tell you that the death rate associated with North Atlantic hurricanes is greater if it was named a male hurricane, who would believe that? Put your hand up if you believe it's higher if it's named a male hurricane. One or two people. If it's female? Ah, pretty smart audience. That's exactly right. Female named hurricanes are three times more deadly than male hurricanes. This is not a statistical fluke. This is like 45 people on average per hurricane if it's named a female hurricane versus 15 if it's a male named hurricane. Isn't that bizarre? Why, why, is, why is that the case? Well, it comes back to your, your brain tricking you. Um, it's cognitive bias. Uh, you saw some of that cognitive bias creeping into the presidential debate yesterday. Um, but this is... Uh, quite simply put down to um, the association you have with the level of threat associated with the name. If I told you that Hurricane Thor is coming around the corner tomorrow, you'd probably take some evasion, evasive action as opposed to a hurricane called Daisy. Um, and quite simply put, this is actually what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis in people's logic and their decision-making. Um, even the most deadly of situations that involve your loved ones, you'll be cognitively biased based on names and presumptions that creep in. And the three examples I've here of Alexander, Alexandria, Christopher, Christina, and Victor and Victoria are actually three names that are used uh, by the World Meteorological Organization in the name of hurricanes. And those are associated uh, with increases in death rate just simply because of the name. Quite remarkable. But what on earth does all this have to do with Alzheimer's disease? You know, we know the brain's pretty complex. Um, it does a lot for you. Uh, okay, we're susceptible to cognitive bias. But it actually creeps in at the level of when we start to think about the disease by, based upon our individual perceptions, as so alluded to in the media. And also affects our bias as we approach something as objective as the science uh, that we use to try and understand how the disease occurs, but also our approach to developing novel therapeutics. And what I'd like to do with the, the remainder of my presentation is go through these various points and highlight how that's affecting the way in which we have approached Alzheimer's disease and how there's a very optimistic future in the recognition the field has now over the last five to 10 years that's gonna transform the way in which we approach Alzheimer's disease therapeutics. 
I believe there's a hugely optimistic future for us, and I want to share with that, some of that with you today. But before I go into that, I just want to recap. Um, many of you in the audience would be very intimately familiar with Alzheimer's disease, but so everyone's on the same page. I just want to remind you that this is a disease that was uh, identified at the turn of the century by a German physician, Dr. Alois uh, Alzheimer's, in his careful observation of a patient, August Dieter, who's shown here in this picture, who developed a, a form of dementia which was very abnormal in her early 50s. And what Dr. Alzheimer's did was to um, examine her brain after death and identify that she had two very unique types of pathology in the brain that we now know to be associated with the deposition of two types of protein in the brain. One is an extracellular protein uh, called beta amyloid, or A-beta, that forms these brown plaques shown in this uh, image here on the right. But the other uh, type of pathology, which is pretty much neglected, I think, by the field for a number of years, is this tau protein that accumulates inside the cell. And tau is one of these building blocks of the cytoskeleton that helps the cells keep their shape and uh, create processes, etc. So it's a unique disease characterized by uh, a form of dementia that has two types of pathology in the brain. There are many um, perceptions about Alzheimer's disease, um, which include it's a disease of aging, only all people get it, it's normal. Uh, there's nothing really I can do about it. Uh, and then ultimately a cure is going to be available, so I really don't need to worry about it until I get old. Well, in fact, those perceptions are in most cases incorrect. Um, it's not simply a disease of aging, and not only old people get it. Unfortunately, young people do uh, are vulnerable to the disease, particularly those with the early onset um, uh, genetic polymorphisms that cause the disease, as well as patients with Down syndrome that have a disease that's very similar to uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's not normal. Only 4 to 5 percent of the population will get Alzheimer's disease, and it's not normal aging. And there are potentially things you can do about it, even in your midlife, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And we're also actively working on not necessarily treatment, but also cures for the disease. I'll touch upon that too. But uh, we're also still struggling with interpreting what we see in the media on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, um, I'm always sometimes a little bit frustrated when I see these headlines coming out on a month-to-month -month basis of an Alzheimer's cure being found. Um, when you dig down a little bit deeper, the subtext is either it's in mice again, We've been very successful in curing Alzheimer's disease in mice. We've done that hundreds of times, but unfortunately none of those have translated to the human disease state. And so there's a lesson to be learned there. And quite often too, um, when you dig a little bit deeper in some of these headlines, it's because it's a post-hoc analysis in a subgroup of people that really doesn't um, stand up to a statistical in, uh, interrogation. And even uh, in August, when I was preparing this talk back on August the 15th, I just took a snapshot of some of the headlines that came out about Alzheimer's disease. And you see um, headlines like, these kinds of jobs help protect you from Alzheimer's disease. Really? Or the Mediterranean diet can boost your brain and reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, underweight seniors may have more risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And it generates these general themes of questions that we all have at the back of our mind uh, and leave us sometimes a little bit frustrated uh, about how Alzheimer's disease is being portrayed in the media. You know, they're saying it's along the lines of Alzheimer's will bankrupt America, uh, the American healthcare system. That's probably true if we don't do anything about it. Um, there are uh, stories of brain training games that may prevent dementia. And then really, from a scientific basis, is that really true? Certainly we know cognitive reserve is a good way of keeping your uh, faculties, and certainly if you were to learn how to do things quickly or, more, uh, or learn things on a, a daily basis doing your crossword puzzles, that's obviously a good thing, but it can really present, prevent a disease like Alzheimer's disease. We see headlines from international conferences of the, you know, the first drug to prevent Alzheimer's disease Again, statistically sub dubious subsets of analyses, so it leaves us a little bit frustrated. 
And then we end up with very confusing headlines like this one, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is declining. How does that fit with what we just heard, that Alzheimer's disease is going to bankrupt America if we do nothing about it? Well, it's all in the wording. Incidence is a, a term that relates to um, the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease for you as an individual at a given age. And whilst it's true in some cohorts and Western cohorts of people that the incidence of Alzheimer's is going down, probably because people stop smoking, they're looking after themselves better, cardiovascular health care has improved dramatically, plus potentially vitamin supplementation. The overall prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, this is the number of people with Alzheimer's disease, is going to triple over the next couple of decades if we do nothing about it. But there are also gems, I think, in the way that um, Alzheimer's disease is portrayed in the media. And this is one of my favorite. Um, it um, uh, was released, actually, at the Toronto Film Fest a couple of years ago. This is still Alice. I don't know if anyone's seen, seen it in the audience, but if you haven't, thoroughly recommend it. It's a very moving story um, about a linguist who gets early on to Alzheimer's disease and the impact it has upon her, uh, her family, uh, and um, the way in which other people are approaching uh, the, the perceptions around the disease. So if you get a chance, I thoroughly recommend going to see this movie. Now, even in science, uh, this cognitive bias I've been talking about um, affects how um, we approach our thinking about the disease and treatments for the disease. Um, and this is shown quite uh, simply by um, some um, descriptions by Sir Karl Popper on the logic of scientific discoveries, the way we work. Um, that is, we're not trying to prove something's correct, we're actually trying to prove something's incorrect to advance the knowledge we have in the field. And if you make a statement, a blanket statement like, all swans are white, it's very easy to prove that something like that is incorrect. You just need the one black swan that shows that to be incorrect. All right? So for me, um, having spent 20 years or so working in Alzheimer's disease research, it's been a bit like hunting for black swans in the dark. You know, we've been, we know the tau and amyloid associated with the disease. Uh, we've been struggling trying to figure out causality. You know, are they uh, a cause or a consequence of the disease? Which comes first? Um, we've been struggling with the animal models, translating the data we find into the clinical setting. And even in my own research in the late 90s, we developed a, a mouse model that overexpressed huge quantities of amyloid in the brain. But the animals are pretty normal. They have these plaques and everything like that that show the pathology. But uh, from an electrophysiological standpoint, the synaptic plasticity was normal. They learned um, spatial navigation correctly. And you scratch your head there and you think, well, this is a bit strange. You know, there's, there's something else going on here. And there are people in this audience who have amyloid in the brain, but you don't necessarily have Alzheimer's disease. Now, some of the clues that we've started to get over the last 10 years that have guided where we're now headed in uh, drug discovery for Alzheimer's disease have come from population studies, uh, including one done in Iceland, that identified a specific mutation in a gene that regulates the production of beta amyloid. And we know from that study that there are people, uh, populations of individuals who have increased risk of getting the disease with one mutation and a decreased risk of getting the disease with another mutation. And this is perhaps the, probably the strongest evidence we have now that there is a causal relationship between amyloid production and getting that type of dementia. But there's still a paradox that we know that you can have high levels of amyloid, but you don't necessarily have the disease. So something else is going on. The other way in which um, the field has changed dramatically over the last five to 10 years is how we're working together as a field. And uh, this, I, um, delighted to see happen. We see these international consortia now working together, trying to find a cure, trying to break down the walls and barriers between different institutions, academia, biotech, uh, and industry. And we're also seeing ways in which even Big Pharma partnering, uh, and I'll talk a little about this at the end of my presentation, on new methods to improve clinical trials and to accelerate the ways in which we can bring therapeutics forward to the patients who need them. Part of the drive for that change in behavior is a recognition of the enormous burden Alzheimer's is going to have on our healthcare systems. In the, in the US alone, uh, it's estimated that there are about 5 million people with Alzheimer's disease, the sixth leading cause of death, and a cost structure of over $180 billion uh, in annual costs. In Canada, 
you know, by 2030, that's going to be almost a million people. And the cost structure by 2040 to just Canadians is going to be about $300 billion. If left untreated by 2050, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease will triple. And these are estimates from the Alzheimer's Disease International, International um, team. And this is, dementia doesn't discriminate. Uh, this is global. And you can see that um, in 2013, a country the size of Canada is, could be filled with all the uh, cases of dementia around the world, 44 million people. And it's projected that that will increase to over 135 million people by 2050. So this is serious. We need to do something as a society. But what can we do? Well, let's turn to the individual to understand the disease better. Let me tell you a bit about what's going on inside the brain. We know that uh, dementia is not normal aging. Um, we know that it's an insidious disease that starts quite often um, with simple uh, memory loss of recent uh, events. You know, not be able to remember the names of family members, forgetting things more frequently, using word substitutions when you can't find the correct word. And quite often, it's the relatives who are more worried about your memory than it is you yourself as an individual. And if anyone has any concerns, I'd thoroughly recommend going to the Alzheimer's Society um, website um, in Canada, uh, which is, has a, a full of incredible resources there to use and to, and to look at. But dementia is not just about memory. It affects behavior, emotions, and even physical activity. Apathy to some things, agitation to other. Coordination and mobility. And from a patient's perspective, as you've heard, there are a lot of complex feelings. And there are a huge number and depth of emotions that are experienced by the patient as well as the caregivers. This is okay, it's a complex disease, it's challenging, and it's okay to have those feelings. There are also moments of lucidity uh, for the patient when I'm sure it's truly terrifying. And in addition to uh, quite often the quantitative changes that we as scientists talk about, there are many qualitative aspects to uh, people's quality of life, the confusion, the disorientation, that are just as important. But what's quite remarkable to me about Alzheimer's disease, and you'll hear this very passionately from um, m many of the families with Alzheimer's disease, is the amount of love, the compassion, the caring, and also the hope that comes out um, as, as a consequence of families being affected by Alzheimer's disease. I want to share the message of hope. You know, I think... We're entering a new phase of Alzheimer's disease research as a community. And there are some novel things we've learned from how the brain works that can help teach us the right path to take. So what is happening inside the brain? Well, let's break that down into our understanding of what human memory really is. And in a broad brush, you can break it down into things like sensory memory, short-term memory that might last a few minutes. Maybe it's that mathematical calculation you have when you bought your cup of coffee trying to figure out what the correct change is. Or it could be a long-term memory, something you learned from your childhood, or something you learned today that you're planting into your long-term memory. And those types of memories can be broken down to whether they're conscious or whether they're unconscious, what we refer to as explicit memory or implicit memory, things you're not really thinking about. And further defined by whether they are related to the types of names, places, facts, and events in the form of declarative memory and procedural memory. So when you're learning a skill or a task, that dog that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. And this declarative memory, which is perhaps one of the most interesting aspects to memory that's affecting Alzheimer's disease, can be further divided into that episodic or semantic memory. So people with those great memories for names and languages versus those people have better memories for space. And in Alzheimer's disease, sorry, and this type of, all these types of memories are influenced by what's called the um, uh, executive function that occurs in the front of the brain. This is a bit like the CEO of the brain that controls and orchestrates what's going on in both hemispheres of the brain, tries to make sense of the world around you. And this is the bit that's subject to cognitive bias. But in Alzheimer's disease, what we do know is happening is that one of the first areas of memory that's affected, but this is declarative memory. 
but uh, it's an insidious disease. It doesn't just reside within the same brain area uh, during the course of mild to moderate and progression to later stages of Alzheimer's disease. You can see that all dimensions of memory uh, end up being affected. But we can learn a lot from just understanding what's happening right at the onset of the disease. If our goal is to cure Alzheimer's disease, that's where we need to start. And in the brain, this is a cross-section taken through the middle of the brain. Um, you can see that different types of brain structures handle different types of, uh, of memory. So the, like I said, the executive frontal cortex um, function in frontal cortex. You have uh, short and long-term memory being handled by the cortex, as well as the structure called the hippocampus. And then emotional memory is being handled by organs like the amygdala, and procedural memory, the dog, being handled by org organs like the cerebellum and the striatum and the visual cortex. But this uh, little organ in the center of the brain called the hippocampus, which is slightly out of the plane of this particular section of the brain, is pretty unique and pretty interesting. There are two parts of the hippocampus on either side of the brain. Um, it's named hippocampus um, after seahorse and, uh, from the Greek um, and campus, um, um, it's a structure that when we take it out of the brain actually looks very much like a seahorse in shape. It sort of curls around uh, the back of the brain. And its role in semantic and, epi uh, and episodic memory processing is absolutely critical. This is the part of the brain, if you take it out, it becomes, it becomes incredibly hard to form new memories that are associated with names, places, and events. We've seen that from patients um, who've had uh, part of this brain resected because of uh, chronic epilepsy. Patient HM is a very good example of that. And what this um, part of the brain is doing is actually a pretty incredible beast is that it's comparing and tr contrasting uh, the images and the uh, messages that are coming into the brain. So it'll be retrieving information from the cortex, comparing that to something you might have seen or smelt or heard. And it's comparing and contrasting all of these signals, oscillating five, five to 100 times a second. When uh, the hippocampus recognizes something, there's an event that's called coincidence detection. So these connect. And the hippocampus will uh, amplify that signal. And so it's a salient signal. It'll either promote a response or encode that uh, signal uh, back into the cortex. And the hippocampus is doing this for numerous memory engrams, hundreds, thousands of times a second, and helping you interpret what's going on in the world. It acts a bit like a Dolby button on an amplifier where you can suppress the noise in the system, focus, try and figure out what's actually going on in the environment around you. And it's this part of the brain that is first damaged in Alzheimer's disease. But uh, it's not just this part of the brain that's affected. If you look at a the brain from an Alzheimer's patient, you not only see a loss of certain types of neuronal fibers, uh, atrophy of this hippocampus, reduced cortical volume, enlarged ventricles, and synaptic and neuronal loss. And you can see quite visually that in late stages of Alzheimer's disease or advanced Alzheimer's disease, a lot of the damage is already done. So our goal and our objective is to figure out before that happens, what is it that we can do? Well, fortunately for us, um, nowadays we don't need to um, rely purely on post-mortem confirmation of Alzheimer's disease. There have been some significant advance advances using positron emission tomography to use uh, radio label traces to identify what types of pathology are present in the brain of living people. And you can do that for both amyloid and in this, um, uh, these series of figures, also for the tau protein now, this is the protein that accumulates inside the neurons. Uh, and here we're, we're seeing a progression from normal, this is called a Brach stage zero brain, to advanced Alzheimer's disease or Brach stages um, five and six and beyond. And you can see that this uh, pathology shown here in the yellow, green, and red just as the start of the, the symptoms appear, which is in Brach stages three to four, we're starting to spread throughout the brain. And it starts in this hippocampal region. And this has taught us a lot about what is actually going on pathologically in the disease. We now know that amyloid, whilst it defines, in part defines the disease, can be present in your brain for decades before you present, if you present with Alzheimer's disease. There's something else going on. And it's this 
tauopathy, the accumulation of tau, which is driving the neuronal, neuronal damage. And so much of the emphasis of what we're doing at Johnson & Johnson and other companies is to try and focus on these early mechanisms to try and prevent people getting the disease in the first place, rather than trying to tackle the disease when the fire is already ravaging the house. So this has taught us a lot about how the damage occurs, and it helps teach us about when and where to intervene. This is important for all of you um, in the audience because um, at least a third of you probably will have at some point in your life elevated levels of amyloid in your brain. Not all of you will get Alzheimer's disease, but you'll be at risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Uh, statistically, another third of you, if you live into your 60s, 70s, will be looking after someone with Alzheimer's disease, and the remaining third will in some shape or form be paying for it if we do nothing about it. For some people, it starts in your genes, uh, but for other people, it starts in your li in your, uh, with your lifestyle and there are actually things you can do about it. And if you know what you can do about it, there are clearly things that positively one can do to change the orientation and the likely outcome of uh, uh, of, of Alzheimer's disease presentation. And there are certainly things that we in industry can do to help with this process. And this is where my optimism uh, comes forward. There are actually over 480 assets that are being evaluated worldwide um, and being investigated as potential Alzheimer's disease therapeutics. And over 130 of these are drugs already in clinical trials. So although the, risk, the, the statistics are stacked against successful drug discovery, I remain optimistic that several of these therapeutics will end up making it onto the marketplace. And certainly by the 2025 timeframe, um, I expect the first generation of disease modifiers and disease prevention drugs from coming onto the market. Now, it takes on average 12 to 15 years to make a drug, to take it from the bench um, to the marketplace. So this really means that these drugs that we're talking about here, those are actually in clinical trials as we speak at the moment. And um, the majority of these are actually in industry-sponsored trials. But we also expect another wave of uh, second-generation drugs coming onto the market in the 2025 to 30 time frame, which will reflect the diverse amount of science that's ongoing here in Ontario and the work that's being done uh, in, with our collaborators through, through J-Labs Toronto. So very realistically, in the 2025 to 2040 time frame, well in the um, period of time before my daughter reaches 60, we're likely to have cures that will prevent, prevent the progression to disease on the market and available to patients. But quite often I hear the cry from uh, some of my colleagues and perhaps more skeptical people in the field that isn't the system broken, isn't industry collapsing, we're not generating enough drugs, the, the problems with getting drugs onto the market, they don't always work, and we see these pictures of, you know, horror story of the number of drugs being approved by the FDA declining over time. This is from 1998 to 2010. And this is sort of a bit of selective reporting because when you look at the big picture, and uh, I've seen several reviews have shown pictures that are in the previous slide, actually the picture is pretty rosy. Um, uh, the productivity of uh, industry and biotech is, is very healthy. Um, in fact, if you look at the 2014-15 figures of new drugs coming into the market, um, they're actually rebounding above and beyond the mean over the last 20 to 30 years. But there's another message there that I want to get across, which is that the, whilst the productivity of industry is there, the cost of doing drug discovery and the source of innovation is changing. And this must influence the way in which we, how we work together. Most new drugs now are actually coming from outside of Big Pharma. And if you look at the number of drugs that are approved by the FDA, only eight out of 27 were marketed by those companies that actually discovered them. So the majority of them partnered or in licensed. Uh, and that figure for Big Pharma is about three out of 14. So it's imperative that there's a very stro strong and close bond between all of the stakeholders involved in drug discovery research from the academic scientists, the biotech entrepreneurs, industry, and also the government stakeholders because we can't do it alone. We have to work together to be successful. 
In addition to simply drugs, um, we know that there are several things you can do about Alzheimer's disease. We can't change our age or our sex, um, but um, we know that um, there are risk factors that will increase or are associated, should we say, with the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, and those do include diet, um, exercise, uh, smoking prevention, particularly in mid-40s, uh, managing cardiovascular and metabolic health, you know, keeping cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes under control, managing stress, and also maintaining cognitive reserve through agility and cognitive reserve training programs. But it's also important to recognize uh, when there is an issue and seek medical help um, as appropriate because not all forms of dementia are caused by Alzheimer's disease. Some types of dementia are caused by, um, it can be caused by uh, diet, um, some can be caused by stresses, it could be caused by an illness that's unrelated, completely unrelated to brain function, it could be peripheral disease. So again, very important to make sure that uh, the diagnosis is um, correct uh, and that uh, people are informed about uh, what the appropriate um, paths forward are for their care. So what is Johnson & Johnson Innovation Centre doing to help? Well, for us um, at uh, J&J, uh, catalyzing innovation is really about creating strong networks of people. This is why we've deliberately created four innovation centres around the globe and created these new JLab facilities to provide an interface into the biotech and academic community around the country. And we have essentially four modules to our Johnson & Johnson Innovation Center teams. We have uh, the physical uh, hubs, the innovation centers, of which I'm part in California. We have one in Boston, London, and Shanghai. We have um, people uh, in the development corporation who essentially invest equity into new companies. Um, our business development team, who help with late stage opportunities and late stage onboarding of late stage clinical assets. And then JLabs, uh, which is our flagship uh, accelerator unit, which represents a no-strings-attached accelerator or incubator that helps entrepreneurs start up their companies, not having to worry about the physical infrastructure of starting a new company, not worrying how to sit down and write about a license or acquire equipment. Um, this really helps people get hit the ground running, test their ideas scientifically, and see whether or not uh, that idea is worth pursuing. And we've created... Um, uh, several JLabs now around the United States, including uh, the uh, first outside of the United States in Toronto. Uh, the original uh, facility, 40,000 square feet, uh, was launched in San Diego in 2012. Uh, and we now have capacity for over 200 companies uh, in, in the country. Um, and about 120 companies already in residence, uh, including, I believe, it's about 25 companies here in the, in the Ontario area. So we're very excited about JLabs. It's a new way of working. Um, it's a new way of us ident identifying and help fostering innovation uh, across the, uh, uh, not just the pharmaceutical, but also the medical device and diagnostics and consumer uh, areas of our business. And allows us to invest very early in ideas that could make a difference to patients. This is not just by putting cash on the table, but it's actually about working with entrepreneurs to help provide them with the experience and guidance as to what's going to become successful. <clears throat> in Ontario, we're, as I said, we're doing several things, actively working with these accelerators. We're working with new company formation. We're working with Mars Innovation to help commercialize some of these companies. And we've also initiated a collaboration with the University of Toronto with the Neuroscience Catalyst Program, which is helping see these new ideas and help with new company for formation. One of the other challenges we're dealing with, of course, is if we're in the business of curing the disease, not just treating the disease, we're also left with a dilemma, well, how do you identify who's at risk? And so uh, one of the really important things that we're doing is to try and work with patient registries and online tools and diagnostics to be able to identify uh, people who are at risk very early in their life so they can get access to these important medications as and when they become available. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the collaborators we have um, around the country and around the globe. This is just a small snapshot of some of the people we have uh, working with, uh, whether it be biotech, government organizations, as well as the local infrastructure here with the Ontario Centers of Excellence, Mars Innovation, and the University of Toronto. And without you, we'd not be able to accomplish half, even half of what we're doing. 
The Neuroscience Catalyst program was a, an innovative program we set up with Ruth Ross at the University of Toronto, uh, which was really geared towards trying to bridge this gap between academic scientists having a brilliant idea, but not being able to translate that into a commercial setting. And quite often, uh, when partnerships are formed with industry, there are always questions around who owns the intellectual property, uh, where does the money go, how is it going to be deployed, how is the research conducted, um, are they going to get access to the tools and reagents necessary to do the work. And we're trying to streamline the University of Toronto's Neuroscience Catalyst program in a way that was really focused on the innovator, not the industry partner. And so we've set this up in an open innovation structure. We could have spent three years probably negotiating the legal contracts around who owns the intellectual property, but decided to step back from that. And at the end of the day, those companies who are successful are going to need a partner to commercialize or bring the asset forward in the future. And that's the point at which we'll engage in a commercial footing. So our goal is to figure out which of these ideas are really going to work, not waste the time you know, haggling over intellectual property rights when we know that 90% of the research may end up failing. So the win here is that the partners within the University of Toronto learn from our experiences what works and what doesn't work. We learn from their research, again, what works and what doesn't work. And we end up as partners to try and help commercialize those entities and that research uh, when it comes to commercialization uh, later and downstream. So far, we've funded over seven programs, uh, including uh, research ongoing with Dr. Don Weaver on a potential diagnostic tool that could be used as an MRI uh, agent that could uh, allow screening for Alzheimer's disease in virtually every hospital in the developed world, above and beyond PET imaging. This will be a breakthrough uh, type of approach to uh, Alzheimer's disease diagnostics. And also, we're delighted that Six Bio, which, which is a collaboration with Dr. Alison McGuigan, is one of the first companies that we've spun out into J Labs, which is a tissue platform that allows us to look at the spatial organization of cells and how this tau protein propagates throughout the brain and try and figure out ways in which we can intervene and slow that progress. So a very exciting couple of projects that we're actively working on. In the field, and I love this slide, is, you know, it's a reference to the fact that if you do find yourself in a hole and you want to get out of that hole, it's probably a good idea to stop digging. <laughs> and this is where um, industry found itself about 10 years ago. And uh, fortunately, has seen the light. You know, I think over the last five, 10 years, we've seen this transformation in the way that uh, advocacy groups, uh, ad academia, biotech, and pharma now all working together on major initiatives, including uh, this one tremendous example, which is the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, which is a multi-site um, uh, uh, center uh, analysis of the natural history of Alzheimer's disease using um, imaging methods, cognitive testing, uh, ways of looking at biomarkers, so we really truly understand what is happening during the disease and during the progression of the disease, so we can um, use this information to conduct better clinical trials, better control clinical trials, and really look at the right types of um, tools uh, to look for disease modification and uh, look for drugs that are actually going to cure the disease. We're also working closely with um, Mike Weiner and his team at the Brain Health Registry, uh, which is a uh, registry that you can go on to brainhealthregistry.com. Uh, you can um, go on to their online uh, cognitive testing program. Uh, this is really designed to help facilitate uh, the recruitment of patients into clinical trials and help us understanding what would it be like if we went out into the healthy elderly population in the 50s and 60s and try to identify who's at risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. We're using these online tests to try and now understand which of those individuals have a high likelihood of amyloid in the brain, and also those individuals who are most likely to go on to develop uh, tauopathy and this progressive aspect to the disease. And then lastly, uh, we've also seen some transformative initiatives take place with the Global Alzheimer's Platform and the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease, or EPAD, and these are clinical programs that are designed to transform the way which industry goes about doing drug discovery research and conducting uh, clinical uh, research. So I am really excited about what is happening in the field and the significant advances that are taking place to transform the work we're doing in Alzheimer's disease, drug discovery research, and to transform healthcare. But it's more about than just good science. It's also about 
you know, how do we work together? If you think about the discovery of DNA, of monoclonal antibodies, of HIV therapies, or even the eradication of smallpox, none of that came about because of one person working in one lab on their own. They all came, back from, came about because of the complex interactions between scientists and physicians working together to cure a disease. Innovation rarely happens in one place. It more than re readily happens where there are teams of researchers working together, utilizing and sharing resources and, and ideas. Our industries, biotechnology and pharma and academia, have always been at the center of discovering new and innovative approaches for healthcare. And I believe Ontario has a lot to offer in that sense. And that's why I'm delighted to be here today and to be sharing some of my thoughts about Alzheimer's disease and how amazing your brains are. But at the end of the day, it's more, than, it's more about people. It's about my daughter, Rose, my son, Lawrence. It's about your husband, your wife, your siblings, your friends, and your family. It's about providing affordable access to healthcare across the globe. That is what we're here to accomplish. We're here to help cure Alzheimer's disease, and we'll be delighted to work with you, with our JLabs team in Toronto, and we look forward to discussing your ideas and your concepts further in the future. Thank you. Why are you optimistic? I mean, there has been lots of research before. Yeah. There's 130 drugs in clinic, clinical trials now, but how does that compare with the decades before? Yes, and, and there's really a huge amount of attrition in the translation of uh, what we thought we understood into the clinical setting. And in part, um, uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, in part, because quite often the drugs that were tested in the past either don't get into the brain, um, and so we're not really truly testing a hypothesis. We've never had, um, uh, as we do now, really effective biomarkers to understand that the brain is, the brain, the drug is getting into the brain, penetrating the brain, accessing the target, doing what's intended to do. And also there's been a lot of attrition because um, our bodies are designed to get rid of small molecules and things that are not natural. Um, our liver is very capable of uh, chewing up drugs that shouldn't be there. Um, and so another reason for failures is uh, lack of tolerability or safety in clinical trials. Um, but uh, to date, uh, we now know that there are drugs um, based on biomarker-related work that get into the brain, do what they're supposed to do, impact amyloid in the brain, uh, either directly in terms of its effects on uh, plaques or indirectly by its effects on the levels of uh, amyloid protein, the CSF, that give me huge optimism that um, if amyloid is uh, one of the causal factors in Alzheimer's disease, at least a trigger for the tauopathy, that if, if we intervene at the right point in time, this is going to be uh, one of the bedrocks of the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, another reason for the optimism is that the new wave of therapeutics that are coming to the market don't just ta tackle amyloid. There's a whole um, slew of new drugs now that are being developed by the field that tackle the tauopathy, the other key player in the brain. So either one or both of those drugs or combinations of those drugs give me huge optimism that over the next decade or so we're going to start to see drugs that truly do impact the uh, pathology and the progression of Alzheimer's disease. I know you're not a doctor, no. but your thoughts, you spend your working life thinking about this. I'm sure many in the audience are dealing now with uh, people they love who have Alzheimer's. What can we do now, other than, as I suggest, tearing down the stigmas to make it easier to live with? But right now, for those going through it, um, I presume there still isn't anything that will slow the progression of the disease, ultimately. Uh, not that it's currently on the market. No, that's correct. Um, uh, there are uh, potential uh, lifestyle choices that one can make in midlife and later in life that may impact uh, the risk of the disease. Again. Uh, alone, the, these are questionable. For example, dietary um, supplementation of vit vitamins and things like that have not really proven uh, to, to help. But if you look at the uh, risk factors for Alzheimer's disease from cohort naturalistic studies, we know that things that are good for the heart are probably good for the brain. Um, so uh, there, I think there's a logical and good reason to think about healthy lifestyles because it, it 
whilst it may impact um, the risk of Alzheimer's disease, it's certainly not going to be bad for you in the long run. So um, those types of things, I think, are things one could consider. You said that one of the challenges for researchers going forward as they get closer is to prioritize what you're looking at, of course, but one of them is how to identify who's at risk. Yes. And you talked about, this was very interesting, the um, MRI that's in development for uh, yeah. diagnosing Alzheimer's. Where are we at with that? And I think of MRIs today, they're working 24-7 in Toronto and uh, the GTA because they're so expensive. I mean, is this realistic that we could come up with an MRI for imaging Alzheimer's early enough for those of us who want to know? Yeah, and there are ways in which one can use um, multiple different types of imaging technology to look at uh, brain function, and that's just one approach. Um, the most validated methods at this point in time are the PET traces, but typically a PET scan will uh, cost the healthcare the system are in the order of several thousand dollars, um, and obviously the patient has to go into the, a specialized pet center to have that work carried out. Uh, MRI machines are much more widely deployed um, throughout hospitals around the country, um, and so with the development of appropriate um, MRI contrast uh, agents, it may be also possibly uh, possible to help detect the accumulation of proteins like amyloid in the brain. These are all experimental, so we're some way away from having that technology advanced to the point in which it will be accepted as a surrogate for uh, something like a PET scan for amyloid. But that's where the future lies. Um, and we're also working on um, blood markers for the disease. Um, obviously, to take a, a cerebral spinal fluid sample from every patient is going to be prohibitive and costly to do so. So we're looking for non-invasive ways also to detect changes in uh, things like cognitive performance using online neuropsychometric testing, and so Cognicity, who's, uh, Mike is probably in the audience, is one of those companies working locally in, uh, uh, in Canada uh, on ways in which using online neuropsychometric testing, you get hints as to your normal cognitive performance. Uh, and that, coupled to the work we're doing with uh, Mike uh, Weiner at the Brain Health Registry, where we're employing a much more comprehensive suite of uh, cognitive tests as well as PET imaging, will allow us one day to draw the line between these subtle changes in cognitive performance over time to mm -hmm. risk of potentially getting Alzheimer's disease. But I, I view um, diagnosis of Alzheimer's a bit like the way in which we view cardiovascular disease, where you have things like a Reynolds score. It's not going to be one, uh, and one test alone that's going to help define your risk. It'll be a, a cluster of things like your familial history, your genetics, do you carry an APOE4 allele, um, uh, what is your age, did you smoke, all of these things. Do you have high blood pressure, diabetes? And there'll be a, a panel of these features that will allow us to say, well, you have X percentage chance of getting Alzheimer's disease over the next 10, 20 years, and these are the things you can do and help to help prevent it. So I think that's probably the way in which the diagnostic uh, world is going to evolve in this space. Uh, one final thing, uh, uh, briefly. Um, we used to talk a lot in the Alzheimer's Society about how to elevate Alzheimer's disease as what I call, uh, loosely, um, a celebrity disease. Um, it used to be that we would see so much money going into diseases totally worthwhile, like cancer and many others, but I know many of us felt that Alzheimer's disease didn't get the import that it deserved given its impact on the aging population. Do you think now it is? Do you think governments recognize it? And what can we do to make sure that that happens? I, I think over the last two or three years, we've seen a major shift in the recognition of what Alzheimer's disease represents to society. And a lot of credit here goes to organizations like the Alzheimer's Association of uh, Canada and, and the US, who've done an enormous amount of work uh, working with um, um, the, the government institutions to get the recognition it deserves. We still have a lot of stigma to deal with. I think we're still tr struggling with catching up with the gap in federal funding that has been in research. For example, uh, until very recently, uh, the amount of funding going into Alzheimer's disease research through the NIH was 10 times higher for oncology, for cancer indications than it was for AD. That's changed. We've seen that now double, and uh, one of the presidential candidates is promising to double it even further. But there's Which a lag one? phase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking. I didn't hear that in the yeah. debate last night. I think night. she's wearing the same color dress oh, as you Oh, okay. Um, but um, the, the, the issue, though, for us is that there's a lag phase. 
You know, this, this is basic discovery research. You know, um, e even when I started working in the lab on a, a, a drug discovery program, it's 10 to 12 years earliest for that drug to get on the market. So we're, we're really thinking about, we need to think more, I think, and this is um, something that's very germane to Ontario and what we're trying to do through JLabs. We need to think better about how do we engage with academia and biotech so we can help shape that environment so you guys are going to do and repeat things we may have done in the past, but also so how that capital can be deployed on the right programs and uh, figure out the ways in which we can help you accelerate the research that you're doing through uh, groups like J Labs, so that we there's a win-win situation here. You know, um, I think it'd be a mistake if we were to sit back on the fence and just let things happen. So yeah. I want to see industry firmly engaged in helping support the biotech community. Thank you, Guy. I see a hand up already, so you're first in the middle of the row. I'm not sure where the mics are. They may come running to you. I, I can speak up. I'll repeat the question. Oh, go there's ahead. a mic down yeah. here, but why don't you talk as you go? Um, as a cancer patient with Alzheimer's in the family, robbing Peter to save Paul is not very comforting. Um, are there other ways that we can raise awareness and find funds without robbing one to pay for the other? It's, it's a very good uh, question, and, and I'm, I'm not advocating we reduce oncology spending to support Alzheimer's. What I'm saying is we need to bring Alzheimer's research funding up. Uh, now, now, how that gets supported, I, I can point to many um, areas of wastage in the healthcare system um, that could be used to support that um, amount of funding of research. Um, if you think about um, some of the studies that have been conducted on wastage in uh, the uh, US healthcare budget, a lot of it comes back to unnecessary testing, uh, litigation, things like that. Um, um, or um, issues where Medicare fraud is in place. So if, if the healthcare systems can tackle those types of issues and address those types of problems, that's going to free up a considerable amount of money for uh, continued research and funding in uh, the space of Alzheimer's and oncology research. But I would say also that one of the, the beauties of the amount of funding that's gone into oncology research is that we're seeing um, recently with the advent of novel life-saving therapeutics in uh, oncology research is that it's broken open the field to new ways of treating people um, in a way that is, is really um, along the lines of personalized medicine, understanding what type of um, therapeutics can work best in which patient. I'd love to see that type of um, knowledge uh, applied to Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease is probably a cluster of different things going on mm -hmm. in the brain at one time. You know, there may be some bit of people with vascular dementia coincidence with, with tau and amyloidosis. Um, but we need to leverage those learnings that we can have from the different, different disease areas to maximize our chance of success for, for AD. Thank you. Uh, there, there are two mics down here. I'm mm. seeing them now in these lights. Um, here uh, at this mic. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. I was interested to hear about how there seems to have been at least recently a taboo against talking about Alzheimer's and is that similar to the taboo against speaking out about mental illness? Is it that both are in the brain and people think that you can you can overcome them by willpower or something? Mm -hmm. that, that's a really good question. Uh, we know that um, the stigma associated with mental illness is a very big one and a very important one and we need to break down the barriers to that and, and help people recognize that um, people with mental illness uh, do need help, and we need to be talking about it openly and talking about new ways to approach uh, treating those diseases. Within J&J uh, &J Innovation, uh, I've just spoken about Alzheimer's today, uh, but we also have a very significant interest in working in the areas of psychiatry and mood disorders. And so, uh, you know, that's a topic very dear to our heart. Um, but, you know, I think the more we can as a field, promote um, an understanding of what Alzheimer's disease is, the progress we're making, you know, provide their optimism and, and encourage people to invest and to support this area of research, I think the better. Um, if we look back 10, 20 years, uh, I know the investment community were put off um, quite understandably by Alzheimer's research because many of the ideas that people were moving forward were not translating into therapeutic benefit. So they see these other areas they can invest in, which are lower risk, and it makes good sense to do that. So I want to promote the optimism that we see, the, pro the significant progress that we're making, 
shared with not just the financial community, but our stakeholders, our peers, and the community at large, such that we get the support, the funding, and the recognition it deserves. I think dementia behavior is frightening to many people, and I'm encouraged that, as I said, it is changing where uh, people are understanding it's a disease, and they are understanding um, and compassionate, more compassionate than they have been, but anything that to do with brain and unusual behaviors, I think, is, is a lot of people don't know how to handle them, and it, it's important, I think, for all of us to help them get over that and help them understand and be a part of people's lives at whatever stage they're in. Yes? That was a good segue into, uh, I'm interested in um, education and awareness. Uh, for us, the first stop was the doctor and knew nothing. So how do we get doctors educated in terms of this new research and um, whether there is early onset? Uh, you know, that's really important and if you can't really get started, uh, it's really tough on the family to find out what's going on. And that's a challenging question, and uh, we need your help. Uh, because I don't think it's something that we as the industry can solve alone. It, it's certainly going to require uh, input from um, a number of stakeholders to get to that point. Um, but um, in 10 years, maybe 15 years' time, when we start to have drugs coming onto the market, um, there hopefully will be very effective educational programs about how to use these drugs, which patients, populations they should be used in, um, you know, guidance provided by uh, not just industry, but the associations associated with these disorders that are going to provide the right type of feedback that patients require. But I, I think this goes beyond just Alzheimer's disease. I think over the next 10, 20 years, the role that genetics and genomics is going to play in personalized medicine is going to um, expand considerably. Um, if you think about um, now, you can go and have your, um, uh, your risk factors uh, assessed by various genomic scans um, from uh, various companies. Uh, and there's these, this information is in pockets and places at the moment, but the cost of doing that um, screening has come down considerably. Mm -hmm. And so over the next five to 10 years, that's going to become something that um, there are a lot of ethical issues that will need to be worked through, both in terms of um, how the healthcare environment and health, health insurers will work in this space. But um, there are a lot of good examples where that type of information is put into the right hands and with the right physicians could be extremely valuable to uh, help um, with situations like this. Um, but I can't speak to your specific uh, instance, but I, you know, again, it's something we need to work on as a field and as a, as a community.